Psalm 95 is quite evidently a, a very joy, joyous call to worship. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. In verse 6, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. A, a wonderful, joyful call to worship. And uh, in, in the psalm, I think you can see uh, four things I'd like to bring to you this morning. There's the context of it. There's the calling that, that we are given. There's the comfort that's in it. And then there's a very solemn caution at the end of it. So let's look at those four things. First of all, there's the context. <clears throat> the cause to worship that we've got here in Psalm 95 uh, come to us in the context of what you what you've got there in verses seven through eleven, the context of trials in the wilderness of life, because life can and is often like a wilderness to us, a wilderness experience. And, uh, and Christians uh, feel themselves often to be uh, very much strangers in a hostile environment strangers in this world uh, and we feel like israel journeying from egypt to canaan and it's hard going all the way it's uh that wilderness was described as a waste howling wilderness and if you remember uh it, at each point in the journey uh the children of israel on the way from bondage in sin into the peace of Canaan. So they're, they're, on, they're on the way under God's care and, and God is with them. Jesus Christ with all his blessing is among them. But each step along the way, they felt as though it was killing them. Why they grumbled if you brought us out here uh, to kill us and our children. And again and again and again, when it got really difficult and and natural impossibilities appeared before them as insurmountable problems. They grumbled and turned in unbelief and looked back to Egypt and said, we'd rather go back there. It's much better there. We didn't have to put up with all this stuff there. Well, we feel that way often. And uh, as we read Hebrews chapter 3, and you could read chapter 4 as well, which is all connected, you could see that the Christians at the time that that book was written were feeling that way too. And, and, so, and so it's very, very important and helpful, you could say merciful and kind, that God in his word addresses those sorts of issues and concerns that we all have as we're going through this life. The children of God are challenged at the deepest level and tried to the very end of their endurance and strength. And the things that they encounter along the way in their life, uh, you could sort of say the, the means or instruments through which those trials come. Now, I think all, all of you, as you sit and listen to that, you, you know in your own minds um, what great issues you face that sort of bring you completely to the end of yourself. Well, that's the context. But this psalm shows us that it's Jehovah God who is leading his people as the all-wise and loving Father. He's leading them in such ways that wisely, lovingly chasten them. And it brings them to the end of themselves and brings them, you could say, now open to and alive to his help. It causes them to turn to him. And that becomes the means of them becoming partakers of his holiness in the great struggle. Uh, that's, that they, they are, you could say, sanctified or changed within themselves. So the way... They think and the way they respond 
uh, undergoes a change. That's that's what God's doing in the lives of all of His people and of you this morning uh, and and of me. So there's a great struggle that we must engage in. Faith will be, must be purified, and unbelief must die in the wilderness. Uh, the new man, that new principle of life in Jesus Christ and of grace and faith must be quickened and, and brought more and more uh, into power in our lives. So faith is going to have to endure trial. That's worth thinking about. Words are easy to speak, aren't they? But listen to that. Faith is going to have to endure trial. Hardship is going to need to be borne with. Loss and grief must be passed through on the way into Cain or heaven. And so every one of us, every believer is going to have to run the race that is set before them, keeping their eye, as Hebrews 12 would say, upon Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame and is sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So that's, that's, that's the context of Psalm 95. And, and, and so you can see why it's going to end with that seeming glaring, shocking uh, caution. Uh, don't harden your heart, uh, as in the provocation. Because that's the context. Okay, so with that, with that before us and uh, girding our loins up uh, to realise that this is not going to be an easy matter, now what about the calling, second thing? Well, here's the amazing thing. This is what I, I find personally so, so incredible about Psalm 95. It's got so many marvellous things in it, but this really strikes me. This is a call to worship in the wilderness. This is a call to worship amidst the trials. This is a call to worship even at the times of greatest distress. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation, even when it feels like our heart's breaking. That's amazing. Well, how's that possible? How is that possible? Well, I think the psalm shows us that it's only possible by looking well to the reasons that are given or attached to that call to worship. And, and when, you, when you look at that, you can see that it's possible to worship in the wilderness because worship looks up. All the problems and the pain are experienced all around us. You could, you could say on the horizontal level. But when you look up, you've got reason to worship because Worship fixes its eye or its attention or grasps a hold of the Lord. That's what this psalm's saying. Come, let us sing because everything's so amazingly comfortable in life. No. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. And so that's, that's an incredible insight into what we need as human beings in our life. Uh, we, we've got it. There, there, there has to be more than what you just simply got in the horizontal level with the relationships and, and all the issues and struggles in life and all, and all the sorrows that attach, it's got to be, there is more. It's God. 
And, and the word of God and, and faith to call us to look up, to look past, to look through, and to see the glory of the God who's got everything so marvelously in his hand and in control and to be able to trust him. That's what Psalm 95 is saying. And, and as you do that, you're going to have any amount of reasons to worship and to do it joyfully because our Lord, we are told here, is a great God. The reasons in verse 3, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. And that's a small g, that second among all the gods because there's all sorts of powers and, and, uh, and the uh, important things in life that are like gods that seem to have power over us. But, but the Lord is infinitely above and beyond. He's far greater than anything in all its influences could ever be. So the Lord is a great God and a great king, sovereign in his rule, above everything that could ever touch upon us or influence us. That's verse 3. And if we say, well, what, what's in his control then if he's such a great king? The answer basically is everything that is. The land and the sea, the two great elements that you're going to ever live among. The sea uh, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his. The sea is his. And he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. And so if we, if we look up by faith, not, not by sight, just the things that are around about us, but by faith, as we see in Romans, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, faith has this amazing power uh, to bring the invisible things into our mind and soul and even to give us the substance of the things that we hope for by faith as you open your eyes and behold your mighty God in all his sovereign power who's got you in his hand, then all is well. And you've got reason to worship. Let me read to you uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, question one. Because I think it touches on this very beautifully. What is your only comfort in life and death in the midst of the world? wilderness as you called to worship God. What is your only comfort? The thing that really gives you peace and uh, is able to let your soul find rest. All is well. Well, here's the answer that the Christian faith as it looks up and beholds God is able to give. Well, my only comfort in life and death is that I'm not my own. But I belong, body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me fr free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way. Now listen to this. That, that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair, can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. That's beautiful. Worship God in the wilderness. We're able to do that as we look up. But the psalm, the psalm gives us, I think, what you could describe as an even more powerful reason or incentive to worship God in the midst of the troubles. And that comes in that second uh, call to worship and what follows. And let me just read it and you see if you can see what it would be. I come... Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And here's the reason. For he is our God. 
we are the people of his pasture and sheep of his hand. Now, when you look up and see that, that's even more amazing and comforting, isn't it? Than the first glance. Now we've got a call to draw even closer to our God to worship as people who he has comforted. People who have met him personally and are able to say, he's my God, he's our God. I'm in his hand. I'm one of the people, that the sheep, it's in the hand of the shepherd. That, that's ever so close, more close. We draw closer uh, as you see that. The encouraging incentive to worship is that he is our God. And we, notwithstanding all the problems and the questions that they pose in our minds and hearts, and notwithstanding how many angry faces might be towards us in all sorts of circumstances of life, we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. I'm confident, you see. That's an amazing confession of confidence. That there's not only a great God as the creator of all, but he's my God. And he's got me in the palm of his hand. So there's an encouragement from his power and dominion, but now we draw nearer. We can worship and bow down before the very face, or better still, in the arms of our faithful saviour the Lord Jesus Christ. For, for this Lord, this Jehovah, is our shepherd, like we sang in Psalm 23. Uh, he is our shepherd through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I like to picture uh, believers and my, my wife, myself, and together with all other believers uh, in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ presented with all our fears and our tears to the Father. Presented to the Father as people with whom the Father will share his love for the Lord Jesus Christ because that's exactly what believers uh, receive. The love of God the Father for his son, Jesus Christ, and all those who have been gathered up into him. It's like as if you're, you're in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ and he holds you before the Father and says, share the love you have for me with them. The God of all mercy and comfort, as Paul describes him so beautifully, who promises that one day soon he's going to wipe away all tears, has gathered you as a believer into his hand. He's done that through the precious blood of his own dear son, Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who laid down his life for you. Nothing, as Paul says in Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. O oh, come. Let us worship. And bow down. And kneel before the Lord. Our maker. In the wilderness. It's possible to do that. It is. Notwithstanding or not. Uh, irrespective of whatever might be presently the situation, if, you're, if the eye of your soul, if the sensitive heart is able uh, to touch upon that reality or have it touch upon your heart, it's possible for that spark of worship uh, to be ignited uh, even in your heart in the wilderness. So you, you can worship as a believer in the midst of your present challenges 
as someone whose life is unfolding in that blessed relationship that I've just tried to describe. You have been gathered by the pure grace of God, the kindness that gives you what you never deserve for Christ's sake. You've been gathered by the pure grace of God into a saving relationship with him. He is your God. And you're near, very near unto the Lord. Near and dear. But look up. Look into the face of your reconciled Father who loves you for Christ's sake. Look, at, look into his face and realize that he'll never let you go, notwithstanding all your weaknesses and your failures and your sins. You can never sin yourself out of the love of God because it's guaranteed by the perfect obedience and blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's, it's okay. You can still look up and you can come back to him and you can worship and you can say, thank you, Father, for this incredible forgiveness that wraps me, as it were, in a blanket of comfort and makes me so I want to fight against my sin with everything that's in me. So we look up. And we have reason to worship. Everything your great Jehovah, your maker, your king, the rock of salvation is in and of himself. He is for you as the rock of your salvation and the shepherd of your soul. And I guess it's worth mentioning he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. There's no, there's no accidents. <clears throat> As the psalm says, we're the people of his pasture. He's got it marked out. And we're the sheep of his hands. No mistakes here. So we can be encouraged also in the fact that this is true for us, but we're not alone. You notice that the psalm says, I come, let us, as one who's speaking to many. Uh, it's like as if the Lord Jesus Christ, the great leader of the praise and worship, stands in the midst and he says, come, let us. And we will worship God with him uh, as he did in his life, so we, we will with him. And we look around. And we see, lo and behold, there are others just like us, believers in the same wilderness experience headed for heaven uh, with, with all the challenges and trials. And we look at one another and we say, brethren, if we look around just at what's happening, it's not going to be any reason for joy or worship, but let's look up. Oh, come, let us worship. Oh, come, let us fall down. Oh, come, let us kneel. And, and there's tremendous encouragement in that. That's one of the reasons why God always leads his people like a flock, never just like a lonely, lost sheep all alone. We worship him together. Well, you need to remember that. Um, there's lots of things that might, in some in many ways, tend to separate even drive apart but, but this is the great unifying thing of the christian life and faith uh, we are all united together in the one lord and the one hope we're headed for the one place and on the way we can support and encourage one another in worship that's what we're designed by god to do to worship him Marvellous, isn't it, that he gives us songs for the worship in the wilderness? Uh, I won't make a big point of this this morning at all, but did you notice in verse 2? He says, let's make a joyful noise unto him with psalms, perfectly crafted words for believers to sing in the wilderness. Uh, when, you, when you read the psalms, there's there's almost no experience that a believer will ever go through in the whole 
of the of their life, joyful and sorrowful, that's not all laid out there and opened up in in its spiritual dimensions. So that it's all in the presence of God as a part of worship. To worship in the wilderness, as as all those sort of gut wrenching and almost heartbreaking expressions in it. Lord, my bones are out of joint. Uh, Lord, I feel like I, I'm in the miry clay. But it's all, it's all praise to God in, in the midst of the wilderness. It's, it's, it's all words that can be expressed to the God in whom we are in the closest possible relationship, of friendship and love. Nothing need be hidden uh, from this God who is our shepherd. So there's marvellous things in this psalm, I think. Let's get to the last point, which is a caution. And, uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't want to become more sort of uh, uh, neg negative and heavy and, and, and leave you leaving the building feeling uh, a great burden. That's not what I believe this psalm's designed to do either. But let me say this, how incongruous, how, how it doesn't fit, doesn't make sense. How, how incongruous or how discordant, like a note out of, out of tune, uh, would it be, and is it, for us redeemed saints who are, who are living, standing in such a relationship and such a position as we've sort of described this morning, Having the glory of such a God who is our maker, our king, our saviour, filling the universe of our mind. How out of sync and wrong it is, or would be, for us to harden our hearts because of the difficulties and say, God, I'm done with you. when the very difficulties themselves are all laid out in the wisdom of God as our Heavenly Father to work good for us and in us, that in the midst of them we look at God and we say, I don't want to worship you. I don't like what you're doing. And because it's so hard, I'm headed back to Egypt like the children of Israel. You remember the children of Israel? Through all those years, or well, actually it's not so many years, through those few brief years uh, until they came to the, to the borders of Canaan, there had been difficulty after difficulty. God had forgiven them for their murmurings and grumblings and continued to bless them for the, for the sake of Christ promised to them. And then they came, remember, to the borders of Canaan itself and they sent in the spies. The spies came back all except uh, uh, Caleb and Joshua. And they said, no, there's no way we can go in there. It's too hard. The giants, the, 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 their war engines are, are, are immense and fearsome. There's no way we could go in there and prevail. No, no, we, we, we're, going, we're going back to Egypt. It's at that point, after those few years, that God said to them, okay, because of your unbelief, you're not going into Canaan. It's 40 years now in the wilderness for you. And uh, in that wilderness journey, there must have been thousands upon thousands upon that millions of graves littering uh, that very relatively small parcel of desert that uh, went round and round in. How utterly, utterly incongruous. How it doesn't make any sense <laughs> for people who are one step away from Canaan to harden their hearts and turn back when it's that very God who is the shepherd who's got them in the palm of his hand, who's led them every step of the way that they're turning away from. I think it's very, very kind and tremendously good that a solemn warning like this is attached to this psalm. It's like the book of Hebrews, which has got... Amazing uh, 
expressions of truth and reality and then warning. Truth and reality, warning. That's what this psalm's like. And we need that. Why? Well, those warnings that, are, that deal with us rationally, so, you know, we're thinking people, we, 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 we are motivated by incentives and, and uh, towards a good and, and, to, and fear turns us away from evil. God, God deals with us as rational creatures and he says to us, think about this. Really think about this. And as he does that, that reasoning with us and dealing with us as rational creatures in light of what's our greatest good, that's the means that the Holy Spirit uses to preserve us in faith. <clears throat> so we don't just quit and give up and, and go lost, and have a, end up in a lost eternity. There's nowhere near heaven. And if we thought the troubles of this life were bad, we haven't even begun to imagine what the troubles of the life to come would be apart from Jesus Christ and his salvation. It's good for us to think about these things and to be brought by the Holy Spirit under the word to that renewed conviction and that, and that being convinced in our mind and having our faith stirred up so that we say to ourselves, yes, I've lost the plot. I, I, I've got it all wrong. I've become confused and bewildered by the problems. I was in danger of saying to God, it's all too hard and I don't want it anymore. I'm turning my back upon very life and salvation itself. But now I can see. Now I can see. And so God uses these things. His word and cautions. Warnings. He's showing us in this psalm that we do need to worship him in the wilderness. And don't give up. Humble yourself. And I've been doing that as I've prepared this sermon. Believe me. Humble yourself and bow down and worship him. Because remember, there's never another time other than now for you to do that. Now, if you think about that, I think you'll agree with me. Um, whenever tomorrow comes, you know, the old saying, tomorrow never comes. If you say, well, I'll do it tomorrow, it's always tomorrow, it's tomorrow, isn't it? But our life is either going to be really lived honestly in engagement with our God now, today, as it says. Uh, today, if you'll hear his voice, hide not your heart, that we either live with our God really now, this moment, or we're not living with him at all. Can't live with him yesterday. Can't live with him tomorrow. It's got to be in the now. And, and that's what this psalm's saying to us. In the midst of the troubles, in the midst of all the problems, when the pain gets really intense, now, come, let us worship. Let us bow down. Let's look up. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that for a few moments we can look in through the window of this psalm into a perspective upon life that without your word would, would probably never even come near to. It. So we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that uh, the Christian church, even though it be small and often very weak, is still able as a means to open the windows and show us a glimpse uh, into the spiritual reality. Help us, Lord, uh, to go not just looking through a window, but all the way through the door 
and uh, and step into and live in that awesome, marvelous reality of the worship of you, the living God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.